to see you guys. How many of you, by show of hands, by show of hands, how many of you, uh, the Old Testament book of Judges is your favorite book of the Bible? Uh, Leviticus crowd here this morning, huh? Maybe more New Testament, New Testament crowd. I laugh at this. When we lived in Scottsburg, Indiana, uh, a guy started a little church on the square there, and he called the church New Testament House. New Testament house. And I said for years and years, somebody should start a church on the other side of the square and call it Old Testament house. Old Testament house. Well, you don't hear many sermons preached from the book of Judges outside of a few stories and characters that might be familiar to you. So this would be true. How many of you have heard a sermon on Samson? Some of you probably have. Yeah, Samson, one of the judges. Yeah, it's a good, good sermon on that. There was actually a movie about Samson in 2018. I missed that one, but he was looking good there. So how many of you have heard a sermon on a guy named Gideon? He was one of the judges. That's a famous story in there, so you've probably heard that one. Uh, how about this? Uh, maybe you've heard a sermon on Deborah. Some of you? Okay, a little less. But yeah, not, not, not as popular a story, but Deborah was the only female judge, and, a, and not only was she a judge, she was a prophet and a great leader of Israel in that time. But outside of that, you probably haven't heard many sermons from the book of Judges. H- has anyone heard a sermon on Ehud? Maybe one? Okay. Yeah, somebody said E-Trade? Yeah, can we get a sermon on E-Trade? That might be helpful. Yeah, no. And so you probably haven't heard a sermon on any of these other guys either. Show the rest of the, uh, those are the rest of the judges, Othanel, Shamgar, Tola, Ibzan, Elon, and Abba. And you don't name your children any of those names either, do you? It's not like Mary, Joseph, Isaiah, Elizabeth. But, though I did think my son's name is Sam, and I thought about naming him Samgar after uh, Shamgar the judge, because Shamgar's story, uh, this is his entire story in Judges, but it's a cool story. Look at this, uh, Judges chapter 3, this is his entire story. After Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. He too saved his, you know what an ox goad is? It's a cattle prod. He was a bad man. He took out 600 guys with a cattle prod. That, that's his entire story in Judges. One judge down. Some of them are even better than that. Well, you might not have heard many sermons yet from Judges, but you know the old saying, for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. You're going to hear quite a few in our series, the book of Judges. In fact, starting today for six weeks, we're going to go through the book of Judges on Sunday mornings. We're going to meet in our small groups throughout the week. If you are not in a small group yet, there's still time for you to do that. Today is the day to get in one. Study this together with us. You can get in a small group. They meet at different times throughout the week. We can give you that information. Worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. Tonight at 6.30 p.m. in the crossroads room, which is straight up those stairs. You'll run right into it. Uh, you can meet with us in our small group. So you meet with us tonight at 6.30. If you're not in a group, we invite you to join us. If you meet with us and you say, wow, you guys are boring or obnoxious or both, then you can find another group next week because there's plenty of others. Okay, give that a try. Uh, we grow better when we grow together. You're going to love this. Now, we're going to do six weeks in Judges uh, right in a row here. So October 13 will be the last week in this session. And then we're going to do something we've never done before. We don't know if it'll work. We're going to take a break, and then we're going to do five more weeks in the wintertime. So 11 total weeks in the book of Judges. So you will hear all total. If you stay with us, you'll hear 11 sermons from the book of Judges. You don't have any friends who have heard that, okay? You don't have any friends who have heard 11 sermons. So when it's all over, if you stay with us, you can go back and you can brag to your friends that you studied the book of Judges for 11 weeks. And they'll say, the book of what? The book of what? What are you talking about? But deep down in their hearts, they'll be... Impressed. Now, deep down in your heart, you're saying to yourself, well, I don't really know a lot about the, the, the book of Judges. What is it? Well, it's part of the Old Testament story about the people of Israel. And the entire Old Testament is pretty much the story of Israel and how God prepares them for the Messiah to come 
to come from them. But the book of Judges is a part of their narrative. After the book of Exodus, where maybe you're more familiar, they were enslaved for 400 years in Egypt. And then a guy named Moses, great prophet and a great leader, leads them out of Egypt. And you probably know that story if you've read the book of Exodus or seen the movie The Prince of Egypt. You know that story. So uh, the people wandered around for 40 years after coming out of Egypt. It's kind of like looking for a parking place at Walmart on a Saturday morning. So 40 years wandering around. And then they come to the edge of the promised land. Moses dies. Joshua takes over, leading them for a season, leads them into the promised land. The Old Testament book of Joshua is dedicated to that part of the journey and battles they fought there with other tribal peoples. And then Joshua dies, and the book of Judges covers the next period of history. Here's a a little chart telling you kind of what it is. Uh, Joshua, 1380 B.C., uh, and then, then they have a king, their first king in 1050 B.C., King Saul, then followed by King David. And the period in between, 330 years or so, could be a little more, could be a little less, that's the period of the judges. So they went from being wandering tribes led by Moses and Joshua, uh, and, and then by the time they got to Saul, they had become a monarchy. But in between that time, in the book of Judges, they, they were kind of a commonwealth, a little bit like the 13 original colonies in the United States. A little bit that way. Didn't have a central government, though they had a common ancestry. They had a common language. They had a common religion. They all saw themselves as Israelites, but they were also 12 distinct tribes of Israelites. Now, some of you will remember how this developed. So there was uh, the, the, Israel, the people of Israel. There was Abraham. Abraham had a son, Isaac. Isaac had a son, Jacob. And then Jacob had 12 sons. And as it turns out, those 12 sons, Israel was kind of a family business. As it turns out, those 12 sons uh, developed into 12 distinct tribes of Israel. And so you'd imagine there's commonality and there's cooperation, but there's also competition going on there. But there's no king to unify these tribes, and there was no king because God was supposed to be their king. Now, how it was supposed to work is that God was their king. He'd already given them his law. The, the Exodus and the Ten Commandments and Moses and all of that. So you remember that. So God is your king. He's given you the law. Now he's given you judges to administer this law and make sure the law is followed. And one more thing, the judges would lead the people. They would lead the army if the people were attacked by other tribes or if they were attacked. And there's a lot of attacking and being attacked in the book of Judges because Judges is arguably the most violent book in the entire Bible. That, that along with Joshua. But Judges is probably the most violent book in the Bible. So you say, Pastor, why did you pick uh, the most violent book in the Bible for us to study? Didn't someone famous that we really love say, blessed are the peacemakers? And yet now we're going to study the most violent book in the Bible. And beyond that, why is there such a violent book in the Bible? Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Why is there a violent book in the Bible? Well, you know, there's a violent book in the Bible because people are violent. People are violent. And not just ancient tribal people. They they were certainly violent. People are still violent. We grieve every week, or at least some of us, we grieve every week when we'll hear the numbers. You'll hear them tonight or tomorrow of how many people were shot and killed in our city of Chicago. And and that's just part of the violence, right? That's just the ones the police know about. Just the people who were shot with, with guns. Doesn't take into account all the other violence that took place and all the other violence that we don't even know about. But it's not just people who live in our city. All of us can be violent. And the people of Israel may be more so because they only had one judge at a time to try to enforce that law and keep people from being violent. We're prone to it, aren't we? We're prone to it. How many of you have been been driving and some other driver cut you off or or pulled in front of you and you yelled at them angrily or violently? Have you done that? How many of you, somebody, and don't raise your hands for this, how many of you did that to you and you got so mad uh, you told them they were number one with a different finger? You don't have to raise your hand for that. Yeah, you get angry with that. We can be just as violent as people in the Bible. There are constraints in our society on us because we know if you get out of control, you'll get in trouble. Get arrested, go to jail, you don't want that. So there's a lot of violence in Judges because people are violent. Some of it's war between the tribes of Israel and other tribes, and we'll see a lot of that in the book of Judges. And other times it's just violence between people as a result of sinful activities, whether it's greed or immorality or idolatry or abuse. And that's because of the situation described by the most famous verse in the book of Judges. Now, if you could quote a verse out of Judges, this would probably be the verse that you could quote. 
So if you're one of the eight people who can quote a verse out of Judges in the country, this would be the verse, Judges 21, 25. In those days Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. Or, or the famous translation, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's a summary of the book of Judges. And one per- everybody did as they saw fit, and one person saw fit wasn't always the same as another person saw fit. And so when your saw fit different from someone else's saw fit, you had conflict and trouble and violence sometimes. And I would say to you that those days, though they seem so far away and so different in the book of Judges, have come back around in our day. Same story, different day. People of Israel had another option. Remember, God had given them His law, law of Moses, Ten Commandments. They could follow God's law, but they didn't. Because they had a lot in common with you. They didn't like to be told what to do. We all enjoy being like the little kid who says, you're not the boss of me. You're not the boss of me. You can't tell me what to do. The people of Israel said that to each other and they said that to the other people living in the, in the land, which was actually a good thing for part of that time. And then just like us, they had this tendency to say it to God and say, well, God, even you are not the boss of me. I'm the boss of me. J.D. Hoth, who was our youth pastor for a while here, teaches at, uh, comes to church here, teaches at Westminster School. And I used to tell me this. He used to say that the, some of the youth would say to him uh, about something he'd teach him in the Bible. They'd say, you know, I hear you and I agree. That's what the Bible clearly teaches, but I just don't agree with that. So God and I will have to agree to disagree on this one. But God and I, we can still be friends. God and I, we can still hang out together. It's okay, Right? This was the attitude that the people of Israel had during the the time of Judges. And this created what what I'm going to call a kind of merry-go-round effect. Spiritual inconsistency. Up and down. All over the place. And the book of Judges describes this cycle both for the people of Israel and for us. Same story. Different day. I want us to read an example of it, then we'll, we'll talk about the cycle very quickly. It describes this cycle. Uh, Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and the, and the Asherahs. Those were, those were f- a male and female foreign pagan gods. And the anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Aram Naharaim, to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. But when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up for them a deliverer. Who will deliver us? Judges. And why would they need a judge to deliver them? Because they couldn't stop the merry-go-round of this cycle. And we've got a graphic that's got kind of the cycle up there so that you can see it. It, It's a very simple cycle. They, they They would be following the Lord and then they would disobey the Lord. And disobeying the Lord would bring, as it always brings, disaster. And disaster would convey to them God's discipline. Because then they realized they'd stop following the Lord. And then the people would cry out to the Lord in repentance. And then God would raise up a deliverer who would deliver them from the disaster. And they would say to the Lord, we will never do that again until they did. Then they would go back and disobey again and disaster would follow. And they would know it's the discipline of God because they broke his law. And then they they would cry out to the Lord in repentance and the Lord would bring deliverance. And they would say, we are never, ever going to do that again. Does that sound at least a little familiar? Same story, different day. All of us have been and many of you are still on that same cycle. And it often follows closely to the fact that you, like the people of Israel, you want to do what you see fit, and sometimes that leads you to ignore God's law. Or even if you don't see yourself as a, as a Christian, or you don't see yourself as a particularly religious person, and uh, you, you disobey some authority, you disobey some law, or someone who is wise, or, or someone who gave you good advice, or you, or you disobey maybe your own conscience. Your conscience told you it was wrong, but you said you were going to do it anyway. So disobedience to some good and wise authority, and lo and behold, disaster came. Perhaps you realized that you deserved it even. If, if, it, if you didn't think it was a discipline of God, you say, well, you know, I guess I had this coming. You cried out for help. If not in repentance, at least you said, oops, my bad. Can someone help me? And by the grace of God and the love of someone in your life, they came to deliver you. Somebody bailed you out. Somebody paid your fine. 
Somebody helped you get into rehab. Somebody gave you a second chance. Somebody gave you a fresh start. Some of you did that your first year of college. Don't raise your hands. You disobeyed everything your mom and dad taught you. You broke every rule that you knew of, and then you went looking for different rules, new rules to break. Some kind of disaster followed, then discipline, then you realized you messed up, you wasted your time, you wasted mom and dad's money. It's on your permanent record, for goodness sakes. Then you cried out for help, and mom and dad or, or others, they helped you get into a different college your sophomore year because you couldn't go back to that first college because you had messed up. And whatever it was, you said you'd never do that again. And you didn't for about a week, correct? Then you went back to it. The book of Judges is about a nation who got caught in that cycle for 330 years. And none of you have been doing it quite that long. But some of you are trying to break that record. Same cycle over and over again. The book of Judges, that they are in that cycle, and here we are so far removed from the Old Testament, yet some of us are caught in that same cycle. Same story, different day. And do you know what? That cycle can be broken, but only by the God who loves you and won't give up on you. And listen, you don't have 330 years to waste in your life, so you need to get serious with God and about God this very day and about that cycle in your life. Because that cycle of spiritual inconsistency can become a very steep spiritual decline in your life. The book of Judges actually details the steps of that decline. Details the steps of that spiritual decline. Now, it begins right after Joshua, the leader of Israel, dies, and the people go into the promised land, and, and it was already occupied by other people, other tribes. Here's how Judges begins. Chapter 1, verse 1. The book begins this way. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, Who of us is to go up first to fight against the Canaanites? And the Lord answered, Judah, meaning the tribe of Judah shall go, for I have given the land into their hands. Now, now, this seems harsh to us, so now we're going to go into war and, and God's leading them into war, but, but, but this is very normal in that day. If you could run some other group out of town, you ran them out of town. Or if you couldn't, or if you thought it would be more beneficial to come to, to an agreement for both of you to live in that area, you did that. You came up with an agreement, and, and as long as that agreement lasted. Until they started talking bad about you. And then you broke up that friendship and you aligned with your new best friend at the time. The whoever zites, right? It's like middle school girls forever and ever, right? It's always these two, and then it's these two, and then these change, and something's happened. Only a lot more violent because these were warring tribes, and it broke out in warfare, and people were injured, and people died, and history is full of such tragedies as is the book of Judges. But the reason that God gives for Israel to drive out these other tribes is it's not, it's not really just about land. So people still fight for land because God's not making any more of it. There's only so much. So people fight for it. And it's not about ethnicity at all. Believe me, the gene pool was plenty small enough already. It was about religion. But look, they didn't even drive the people out. Judges 1 all the way through through some verses there. They, They didn't drive them out. The Benjamites, one of the tribes, they didn't drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. And so they live there till this day, they write. Thus the Israelites lived among the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. They didn't drive them out. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors who brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped the various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook the Lord, served the Baal and Asterisk, the male and female deities of the land. So they came into the land and they don't, they say they can't drive out the people in the land. So they settle in the land with these other people and they begin this cycle of disobedience, forsaking God and his law and following and worshiping the other gods. Be they religious gods or be they political gods or the cultural gods or the environmental gods, the moral gods. Everyone does as he or she sounds fit, uh, sees fit. Does that, does that sound familiar, uh, American Christians? Same story, different day. They looked around the various options in Canaan and they said, hey, uh, we want some of this. We want to do some of this too. Yeah, we've been given the law and we understand that, but we want to do this as well. I mean, everybody else is doing this. This is how it works in the land of Canaan. We don't want to be weird or anything. We don't want to be different from everybody else. We want to be included. 
And it wasn't long before they'd forsaken God and they'd abandoned his law and they'd immersed themselves in the culture and the religion of the Canaanites. Now, the, the problem was the religion of the Canaanites. The Baal and the Asherah, they were male and female deities that people worshipped and they were idols. And, but the problem was not just that they were idols, although that was a problem, but it was what went into the worship. It's a little different. So if you went to the 9 o'clock service at First Baptist Church of Baal, be a little different than here. Order service to be a little different from here. So, so they, they, they wouldn't have worship there. It wasn't singing and praying and preaching and communion. It was prostitution and sacrifice. Not quite the same. Sometimes they would sacrifice people to try to gain something from their God. So, so you, you, one week you might get to come to the altar. The next week you might be on the altar. They would sacrifice adults. They would sacrifice children to gain their God's favor. And, and, and God said to Israel, you can't go down this road. You can't do this. But they did. And so God let them be conquered over and over again by the very culture they copied and embraced. Does that sound familiar? God might let them be overcome and conquered by the very same culture they copy and embrace. Same story, different day. Well, our culture's different, you say. We don't talk about Baal or Asherah, and we certainly don't sacrifice children, do we? Oh, but the norms of our culture, based on everyone does as they see fit, individuality and immorality, materialism and greed, they rule and many people have been conquered by them. And just like Israel, when that happens, you begin a slippery slope of spiritual decline. And it may go slow, but it goes on for a long time. Israel went down this path in the book of Judges 330 years. And you can easily see the steps of their decline. We'll go quick. That's written in my notes, so it must be true. It says, we'll go quick. We'll do it. Step one, toleration. Toleration. They, they, they didn't drive those people out. They tolerated that. You can imagine, say, yeah, you know, they're, they're sacrificing children down at First Baptist Church of Asherah, but... But look, they're doing as they see fit and, and they think it's justified and they want something for their... Let's not make a fuss about that for goodness sake. There'll be trouble. People, the neighbors won't like us anymore. Might kick us out. Won't have any friends. So they look the other way. But before they knew it, they were at step two, assimilation. Assimilation. Thus the Israelites lived among the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Parasites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. They assimilated. They got what they wanted. No one thought they were any different than anyone else. No one thought they were weird. Can I ask you, a lot of you anyway, I'm going to ask you an awkward, controversial question. Okay? And maybe it's going to make you mad. Maybe it'll make everybody mad. I'm going to ask you the question anyway. Okay? I'm going to ask you this question. Just think. Don't get mad. To those of you who are politically conservative first. You vote for politicians, maybe even you vote for the president. Are you significantly different from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Trumpites, and the Jebusites who are part of that group? And if you are, okay, if you are, if you're different, are the ways in which you are different the ones that are most significant to your daily life? And would others in that group know that you are different? Do they know you are different? Or, or do they think uh, you're so assimilated, you're no different other, and you just think there's an invisible God that you worship? Think about that. Okay, now to those of you who are politically more progressive. Okay, we've got a wide variety of people. You vote for Democrats. You watch the eight-hour CNN climate change debate. You'd vote for Elizabeth Warren, even though she's not Native American. Come on, you know that's funny. It is, it just is. Come on. Are you significantly different than the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Bidenites, if that's a word, Jebusites, who are part of that group? And if you're different, are the ways that you're different the ones that are most significant to your daily life? And would others in that group know that you are different, or do they think you've assimilated and you are no different other than you believe there's an invisible God that you worship? Which way would it be for us? After assimilation came imitation. They began to worship those gods. 
Judges 2, 12, and 13. We've read that. Even though they said in Joshua 24, before Joshua died, they said, you can, you can go to your grave knowing that we will serve the Lord God only and obey Him. It's okay. And then they didn't. Then they began to become just like the people around them. Step four was rejection. Verse 12, they forsook the Lord. The God of their ancestors brought them out of Egypt. They followed the other gods around them. Now, if you would have asked them, do you still believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? They would have said, sure we do. If you would have asked them, do you still believe in the law? They would have said, yeah, we got a copy of the law. It's a, it's a conversation book, a coffee ta- table book in our living room. Which reminds me, we need to dust it because we haven't read it in a while. But God is the king of their lives and their law guiding their daily, his law guiding their daily living, not a chance. How they really live was just like everyone else in merry old Canaan. Everyone did as he or she saw fit, same story, different day. But into that cycle, God sent a deliverer. Judges 2, verse 18. He sent a deliverer, yet the cycle and the decline kept going because they needed a different deliverer than these 12 judges. They needed someone who was more than a judge. Only God himself is that deliverer. You need a better class of deliverer to get you off that cycle and off that decline. Paul would write this in Romans 7, What a miserable person am I who will free me from this life dominated by sin and death. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. One of the things that Judges teaches us is that only God can deliver us from these things. These cycles of spiritual inconsistency, only God can deliver you. Steps of spiritual decline, if, if that's where you are, only God can deliver you. Some of you are in a season of spiritual stagnation. Only God can deliver you. Changing churches every few months won't do that. Sinful habits and practices trapped by that, only God can deliver you. Forsaking God and His church, seeking other types of spirituality, uh huh, only God can deliver you. Here's the best thing just like He did for Israel, God will deliver you because God loves you and He won't give up on you. Same story, different day. As opposed to all the other little gods who you can and maybe you do worship and serve. Here's what the book of Judges teaches us. We've we got to go quickly now. He is the God who saves, not the God who enslaves. He is the God who saves, not the gods who enslave. If you want a, another book in the Bible that, that reinforces and teaches what Jesus said about sin leading to slavery, Judges is your book. The Israelites followed the gods of these other people because these gods promised them power and freedom to do as they saw fit in their lives, which is what everyone wants. And they eventually realized, as you will realize if you haven't, that that freedom is an illusion. And behind the curtain of freedom is simply you becoming enslaved to what you have chosen. You start off as the master, you end up as the slave. And like the people of Canaan did to Israel, those sins that you choose keep plundering your life as well. I'm slowly getting older, very slowly, amen, very slowly, perhaps not wiser. But I have learned something over the years where God's word clearly says to do something or not to do something. It is always better simply to follow it. Every situation is not as clear as others, obviously. I'm just like you. I want to and I can rationalize how this situation is so unique in my life that it would be better for me to ignore God's word and to go with what our culture tells us I should do. But I know that one God saves and all other gods enslave. And I can rationalize the slavery as good as you can. We were at lunch the other day with the staff. Joshua and Aaron were talking about drinking soda, drinking Coke or Diet Coke or whatever it is you drink. And People stopping doing that, and, and I chimed in. I said, hey, uh, I, I'm like every good smoker. I can quit any time I want to. I just don't want to. Waiter, can I have a refill over here, please? But there's a God of freedom. The leader of Israel, Joshua, said, choose this day who you'll serve, whether the gods are your fathers, the gods of the Amorites, and whose land you live. For me and my house will serve the Lord. Number two, time changes, but truth does not. Jesus is still the way, the truth, and the life. 
If you choose something other than Him, you will be enslaved by what you choose. And if you get caught in the steps and cycles of spiritual decline, imitation, rejection, disobedience, waiting for disaster to come, listen, one day the disaster that's going to come, it may take a long time or it may be around the corner, one day the disaster that's going to come is, is going to be your own death. Turn to the God who can set you free. It's always true. That never changes. Last one. Your generation must tell the next generation. You say, which generation are you talking to? All of them. Whichever generation you are this morning. If you're the greatest generation, if you're the baby boomers, Gen X, millennials, Gen XYZ, ABC, whatever you are, whoever comes along next. It's my observation, though, that sometimes things get lost one generation to the next. Sometimes bad things get lost one generation to the next. For instance, the mullet haircut is gone, correct? That's a good thing. Let it go. But then there are bad things. Speaking of bad things, did you watch the Bears the other night? Did you watch the Bears? It's terrible, isn't it? Here's what I heard, though. Next week, this is good Good news. I don't know if you saw this on the press conference. Next week, uh, the offense is going to play. They're going to play next week. They didn't play this week. They're going to play this week. So it's a good thing that that'll be, that'll be novel. Yeah. It's good things. Bad things. Here's what's important. One generation away from losing the story of God. Judges chapter 2, real quick. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, meaning the, the generation that knew Joshua, maybe Moses, another generation grew up who, neither, who knew neither the Lord nor what He had done for Israel, and then followed the rest of that. Then, then they did evil in the sight, so they forsook the Lord, the God, they followed the Baals and Asherahs. They had heard the story of God, they just didn't care about it anymore wasn't important to him. It had been replaced by the next shiny object and the next fun experience. And it all happened in what? One generation. And what followed that was the entire book of Judges. And the cycle of disobedience, disaster, discipline, deliverance. What followed was steps of spiritual decline, toleration, assimilation, imitation, and finally the rejection of God. One generation. One generation. If you're a parent here this morning, think about that. In one generation, the people of Israel went from a people who saw God knock down the walls of Jericho to a generation who who doesn't know or believe in God at all. See, if you're a parent and you want the next generation of your family to know the story of God matters, you'll not only have to tell them, you'll not only have to bring them to FBC Kids downstairs, which, by the way, would be a great start, but they'll have to see it in how you live and how you prioritize what matters as demonstrated by how you spend your time, how you spend your money. And First Baptist family, all of us, your generation, whatever generation you are, you have the responsibility of making sure that the next generation knows the story of God in Jesus Christ. And here's what we know, the millennial generation, the Generation Z after them are less likely than previous generations to know the story of God and believe the gospel and be a part of God's church. Which is why, by the way, here we focus more and more of what we do on those generations. And I would say to you from the bottom of my heart that the, the, the responsibility, how much you'll res- commit to the responsibility of telling them the gospel story and how much you're willing to sacrifice for that mission is the degree to which this church will continue to make an impact for the gospel here in Elgin and in the Fox Valley and around the world. Because as it turns out, as it turns out, just like in the book of Judges, we are one generation away from the book of Judges right here at First B. Same story, different day. And I'll close with this. I know we're late, but we are. But that's not our story. That's not our story. That's never been the story of this church. Our story is that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been at the center of who we are and what we do for over 180 years. And like Jesus himself, we didn't come to this community over 180 years ago to be served, but to serve. 
And we've always known that our greatest gift to God is to pass on the story about a Savior to every person of every generation as the Holy Spirit leads us and as Jesus gives us the opportunity and the resources to do that. And we do that because we have a deliverer who is more than a judge. He's a God of grace and mercy. He's a God who'll help us, who'll help you break the cycle of disobedience and disaster and discipline and deliverance. He'll help you get off that steep, slippery slope of spiritual decline. And no matter who you are this morning, or where you are in that cycle or on that slope, this deliverer will reach out and take your hand, lead you home. Because unlike all those other little g gods that you could serve, whether they're your habits or your appetites or your inclinations or your family, wacky family history, whatever that is, all those other little gods that you could serve who will ultimately enslave you and finally throw you away, your deliverer, the one true God, actually loves you. Those other gods never have, never will love you. The one true deliverer loves you and died for you and he will save you. He did that for the people in Judges. He did that for the people in the Old Testament. He did that for people in the New Testament. He did that for people throughout history. He's done that for many people right here this morning of all generations. He'll do that for you. Same story. Today.